suggestions were if they turned up to know when they are set for exploitation or an issue that they care about, such as violence or tensions with China. So even though you can work to one intersection of politics and China side, actually in the UK we're seeing thousands of people every single day getting messages. And again, they don't have to do any work to get that. They just have it sent directly to them. And we think that's another important thing. It takes effort to go onto a website and to look something up. You can deliver information to someone's email box or to their Twitter feed. It makes things so much easier for them to engage. Here's another website that we run in the UK called Fix My Street to make it easy to report potholes, broken street lights, graffiti, things like this. This problem exists in the UK because most people don't know which council to report the problem to. So the website makes it very easy to just put in your location, a map appears, you click on the map, make the report, and we send that report to the responsible council depending on the category of the problem and the location of it. And it's a very popular site, we handle about 2,000 uh, reports a week, a week. So about 100,000 reports a year. Um, this is another site that we do, uh, it's called What Do They Know, and it makes it really easy for citizens to make freedom of information requests. We handle about 50,000 a year, about 20% of all the requests in the UK. And not only does it make it easy for people to raise the request, it publishes both the request and the response online. So we've got a database now of over 200,000 freedom of information requests, a massive amount of data that's been released by government that anyone can access just simply by searching on the site, or indeed just by Googling because it's well structured. And for every request that's made, but around 25 people actually go on to read it, so we know that we have a much wider reach. Um, all our source code is uh, open source, of course, <laughs> under the, uh, the Faro license, uh, and you can see it on GitHub in the My Society repo, or from our website. Right, one of the things that we've just shown you is um, because we've been, because we are now old, and some of these sites have been running uh, 10 years, it's not just our code that's on there in the GitHub repo, but also the experience that came from running these sites and iterating them in response to what did and didn't work. So for example, there's a lot of um, uh, cunning uh, user interface design that we learned the hard way by the sites being improved through iteration. So one of the things that um, uh, is easy to overlook when we share source code in something like, it, when all of us share source code in a uh, repository like GitHub, is that there's more than just code going on, there's actually the experience that we have from running these sites as well embedded in that code. So Populous is something that we founded with Ciardano and Pedente. Um, Felipe might be in the room, so from there, or he might not be. Um, he was speaking earlier today, you may have heard him. Um, they are a great organization, and this is their leader, who is the office dog. <laughs> we think he's not their leader, he's the head of security. Sorry, he's the head of security. <laughs> they, they claim otherwise, but we think this is the most important person in the organization. He's called Ferocious. Um, they run a vast number of websites uh, in Chile and also across, they work with partners across Latin America. And we came together to solve a similar problem, which is we've been building these sites in the UK, and over the last three or four years, we've realized that lots of other people around the world have the same problems. So we've been working to make our code much easier to reuse, and something like, um, partners in something like 25 different countries currently run versions of the software platforms that we've built. But we soon began to realize it's actually very hard to build one solution that's gonna work in Korea or Ukraine or Germany the problems there for parliamentary monitoring are very, very different. And what we thought we should do instead is to break these complex sites into pieces, into components. And each component should aim to do a single specific task. And that is what uh, gave birth to the Pop Loose movement, a group of people who wanted to work together to make these components. Now the, uh, the purpose of the components is what we're going to... Uh, by the end of our presentation, you should have a good idea of not only the um, things that we think they're helping with, but why we did them, and also how we're doing it. And there is no secret here, this is about sharing source code, but how we can share um, code better. So here's a very simple use case, which is that if you have a database, uh, the problem of having a database of politicians. So suppose that you have collected a list of representatives, which often in many jurisdictions is, a, is the hard part of this problem. If you have a list of politicians, your next problem is you want to publish that on the web. Now it turns out, if you have a collection of pictures of kittens, 
the internet makes it very easy for you to publish this kind of information. <laughs> but for some reason, politicians are perhaps regarded as, as less appealing or whatever. The idea that actually publishing the data you collected um, should be as easy as making, say, a, a Tumblr or a Pinterest page is a provocative one, and this is what a poppet is trying to do. This is uh, uh, the component for people and organizations. Now, if you have uh, if you're a developer, you'll know this is easy, it's just a person table in your database. And that is the big mistake that everybody building sites like this makes, because if these are politicians, politicians tend to belong to political parties, so suddenly you've got the situation of membership, you can cope with this, and then you realize actually politicians tend to change parties, they belong to parties for periods of time, parties coalesce with other parties and form coalitions and change, and suddenly you realize that the data structure that you, you started with a simple person table becomes complicated. So our experience of working with political data means these kind of edge cases are already encapsulated in the database. What's actually going on here is the user enters data, which is unsurprising through a web interface. You only drive my... <laughs> <laughs> um, so the, the uh, Poppet has a nice user interface for somebody to enter the data in. Uh, however, if you've already got it as a CSV or um, a spreadsheet, you can get it in that way. It provides you with the usual crud that you would expect um, in the back end uh, of the database. Um, and maybe that's all? No, because as well as letting you put the data in, importantly, it publishes the data through a well-published and documented API, which makes the idea of putting the politician's database online useful to everybody, not just your own project. Um, so the way this might work is that, uh, or I should say why we think this is important, is because of in the civic tech world, it's generally the case that we are not awash with money. Um, and generally, projects uh, like parliamentary monitoring sites run by a group will start with maybe funding, but certainly uh, volunteer effort. And volunteer effort often includes good developers. There are problems with both money and volunteers. Is that money quickly runs out, and volunteers, particularly devs, if your devs are good, they will be being um, targeted by people trying to pay them to do real work in the real world. So you only have a finite amount of time that you can use either the resources of the, or the money or the volunteers. Or another way to say it is volunteers are like snowflakes. They are beautiful and unique when they arrive, but very quickly they melt and have completely disappeared. So one of the things to do is to make sure that you get the maximum uh, benefit from your resources at the start of the project. And if the developer wastes their time building the infrastructure, like the person table, um, all the time they're doing that, they're not actually working on the local and interesting part of the project, which is tends to be the reason why they volunteered in the first place. So part of the idea behind this is to build um, the infrastructure so that you don't have to spend your time doing that part of the project. Now to start with, it could be that you're just connecting over HTTP, so it's really completely separate site. Um, if there's latency that you want to overcome for that, you could host it locally and uh, talk over the same API, or even use a native li library. The idea about this is that the once you, once you have started using it, the transition to make it part of your bigger project shouldn't be too big of, big of a problem for you. Uh, and so this was Poppet for people, organizations, and positions. Um, you can uh, uh, see examples of it on, our, um, uh, on the My Society's uh, in the hosted instances of Poppet. But there are URLs at the, at the end. Um, another example, again, of a simple tool is something we call MapIt. And this solves the problem that um, everyone knows where their location is, but they don't necessarily know what area they're in when it comes to politics. So uh, constituencies will have boundaries, but actually trying to link a place like standing in this room to a political area uh, requires a bit of work. And um, we've got a tool to make it easy for anybody anywhere in the world to solve the problem. So the user can click on a map or type in a postal code, and it will. Um, give you this kind of information, which, um, if you're not taking technical, doesn't look very exciting, but is massively, massively useful for running the kind of political sites that we do, because it means you can find out what area you are in, and hence you can find out which representative you have representing you. And the next next technical, so Dave will explain, oh no, that, that then you can see prettily on a map of the boundary, uh, and you can download that and access it, 
the next bit is technical, so David will explain the next bit. How, te how technical is that? If you're interested, this data is simply coming off the OpenStreetMap project. We've, um, uh, we take all their uh, administrative boundary data and put it into MapIt. So if, you're, um, uh, if you use MapIt anywhere in the world, if the OpenStreetMap project already has the admin, data, uh, admin boundary data, we expose it through that. This is simply the JSON for the first page that we saw with HTML taken off the end of the URL because it's a function is a useful API. I don't actually understand what all of that means, but it's very impressive. Um, one thing I found that Tom Steinberg likes to say is that basically everything that you do or cannot do, pretty much everything that you can and can't do, has been decided somewhere by somebody in a meeting. It might have been a meeting to write a law, it might have been a meeting where your boss was having a conversation with his boss or her boss, but the fundamental thing is so much stuff gets talked about in meetings that the transcripts of those meetings are possibly one of the most valuable resources that we can open up to the world. There's a big problem with that though, and that is that often when governments publish information, they will publish it in really cumbersome, difficult to access PDFs. And this is, I mean, it looks like something from the 19th century, but you'll see the date in the top corner there is actually from 2011. And this is a transcript from a big inquiry that Parliament in the UK did into journalists who are corrupt, who are hacking into phones, who are paying a policeman for information. Now, this is a really important um, investigation, but if you wanted to search and find out meaningful parts of it, you would actually have a massive problem because you'd have to go through a series of PDFs and they're structured like this and you'd have to search and search and search. From a, a technical point of view, you can see if you've ever done any parsing of PDFs, which I know some of the people here have had to do, this is a particularly hostile way to lay out a PDF because there are four pages on every page, but actually it's a hostile way to lay out a page for a human to read as well. So what we did was build a tool called SayIt, and what it does is make it really, really easy to take this information and publish it in a way um, that is easy for people to access, easy for people to link to, you may know Joanna Rowling as J.K. Rowling, the author of Harry Potter. She was a witness in this investigation. And this is an example of one of her speeches. And what she is talking about here is that a journalist put a note into her young daughter's lunchbox at school to try and get access to her mother to find out how the seventh book was going to end. Um, uh, that plan didn't work, amazing. <laughs> but uh, and we were not going to tell you how the seventh book ended, in case you don't know yet. But Dave did cry. <laughs> um, and one of the things that may be obvious to you is that this kind of thing, of course, was not being fully reported in the press, which was how generally this information would normally be spread. So the idea of exposing transcripts like this one to the public in a way that is easily shareable is, becomes quite significant when you realise the example we're using is in the context of the press not wanting to report it. And so, say it isn't designed as a front-end website in its own right, it's generally intended as, as a component that you can plug into another website. But just to show you, it can do nice things like show you every single time J.K. Rowling spoke during the inquiry, she gave 158 speeches, you can see the longest one, you can see sometimes she just said, I do, in response to a question. And all the speeches, of course, are deep linkable as well, which is super important to encourage people to share which um, largely means uh, on Twitter or Facebook the idea of being able to have a URL linking deep into a specific thing within the uh, transcript. This is, this is a key point because that's not the case with most published transcripts as it is today, particularly in, in hostile PDF form. And this is um, a site that we provide the technology for in South Africa. We work with a local partner there. And this was, oh, it's gone. So um, this was the first site that we built where we actually use Say It, and it has the proceedings of Parliament on there. It has the questions that have been raised by members of Parliament, and they're stored in Say It, and it makes it very easy for people to search, find out what South African politicians have been saying, what they've been doing, and to, as Dave says, really importantly, share links to little specific chunks of what's been said. So there are other examples of components which we'll just point out to you. Uh, write it is a component which makes it easy to send messages to politicians, for example. Uh, the idea there is if you've already got a, um, uh, a database of politicians, maybe a pocket database, it's easy to, uh, to then provide a, a front end so that people can write to them. 
uh, vote tracking and accountability from our friends in uh, Sina in Malaysia. Uh, made the uh, excellent observation that a, uh, a corrupt politician, really, corruption is just a bug in a human being. So another way of uh, thinking about it is that really it would be great to have a bug tracker for politicians so that you can raise an issue and, and watch how that goes. Uh, to, to track the, uh, make accountability of the behavior of politicians, so an example of an, another kind of component that we um, envisage. Um, the actual definition of a component is not very technical, and we've identified about seven things that we think it should, it should cover. It should be part of the civic democratic scene. It solves a single problem, because that's what makes it useful or ignorable to people who want to use it. Um, where appropriate, it plays nicely with the other components. Platform agnostic, um, we're not specific about what language these things are written in. Generally, they work as web services over HTTP. Um, uh, a key thing that we said at the start is that we're avoiding the error of building uh, local dependencies into any of these things. Of course, it has to be open free source, and it has a stable and well-documented API. And this is because open source is not enough. It's not okay to dump your GitHub repo on someone and say, hey, it's free, you can use it. The implication there is it will also be easy because all the work's being done for you. We know that's not the case, and this works because of Good documentation, the community actively supporting um, uh, people using it. And I should say this community is not just the developers who wrote it, but a key thing is other people using the software. Because those are the people who will say, that problem you're having, we've had that problem as well. And that's how you solve it, by sharing the stories about using them. That includes, provocatively, stories where it doesn't work as well as where it does work. Uh, and I think the stories point is a really important one because um, I know the developers of the movement probably hate me saying this, but often with the projects that we run, technology isn't the hardest part. We know if we throw enough development time at it, our genius developers could solve anything eventually, but that will just get you a site launched. It won't get you a site used. It won't get you a site that makes an impact. Um, one thing that Dane likes to say is the process of creating a civic action site is not like printing a poster. You don't just do it once, stick it on the wall and walk away. It's much more like publishing a magazine. Every week or every month, you've got to be making sure there's more information on there that you're really driving awareness. And I have to say, we've run lots of projects where we've worked with partners, and they failed. There's no one got to the site, or hardly anyone. No reports have been made. No one's used it. And so a very important part of the Federation of Pop Loose is for us to work together as a community to learn lessons and tell stories about how we get people to use these sites, how we get people to understand and engage. So we have gone fast. I hope, I hope we've been um, interpreted as well, so I hope we haven't gone too fast. Um, uh, and we've shown examples of the uh, use cases of these components, um, why we've uh, adopted this approach, and how we're doing it. Um, yep, so that's the, the URL popular.org. Hopefully our colleague Jen has given you stickers. If anyone doesn't have a sticker and would like stickers, we have your stickers we can give out to you. Um, and the most important message is to say, please do check it out, do come get involved. Um, this, is a, this is a federation run by its members. Anyone can become a member, anyone can join it. There are two founding organizations, but already we have people in a dozen countries who are actively involved. Uh, I should also say just a huge thank you for letting us speak here today. It's been a great honor to meet so many people who are so passionate and enthusiastic and so hear so many stories and also to be at a conference that's simply so well organized, it's been astonishing, so thank you very much. In the photograph of the Populous uh, Convention you heard that was earlier this year, you might have recognized the familiar face that CL was there yes. the, when we kicked this off in earlier this year. Mm -hmm. uh, last year. Mm -hmm. April. Last year, is it? Yes. April. April. Yeah, the April. April. Yeah. Um, well, this isn't about developers as well, which is a key point, although I'm here as a developer. the. Um, the way that the stories are shared is because it's people using the sites as well as people who want these kind of components as well as the people who build them. So it's not a specifically technical group. And I should say I'm the least technical person in the organization. I look after finance and international projects. Um, but even I have useful stories to tell about what's worked and what hasn't worked. But if you have any technical questions, please speak to Dave rather than me. So thank you very much um, for your time. If you, we have any questions, we've got about seven minutes left. Hi, uh, as a developer, we are very 
clear that uh, we, if we breathe in into pieces, it's uh, very good for maintain and for review. Yeah, but for, um, for general public, it's, it's a little bit hard to say you should use this and use that and uh, uh, so. Yeah, how do you stop this problem? Um, the way, a good example is say it. So, Say it is simply a tool for publishing transcripts. No member of the public is going to care about that. They don't care how the transcripts are being presented on the screen. So in the South African Assembly, it's part of the website. But actually, the Levson Inquiry, which had the quotes from J.K. Rowling in, um, we've set that up as a standalone website. We've also loaded another one with the plays of Shakespeare to demonstrate how this could work. Um, so actually, as standalone sites, they can be useful if you, if you have one problem, which is you have a, a, the, a document, maybe a play that you've written that you want to publish. Actually, it might be a way of doing that. But we generally think that the idea of the new working as components is more interesting to developers yeah. than the public. But it's yeah. worth saying that um, hopefully, because we've, we've made lots of mistakes and we thought about how to present it, the reason that developers will want to use it and that people will want to visit the sites made by it is because they will present the information much, much better. So the member of the public won't choose to use Say It, but hopefully they'll choose to use a site that's powered by Say It simply because it's a better way for them to read stuff and that stuff. And even more provocatively, even if they don't, the idea that these are good reference sites about if somebody implements their own, they should operate in this kind of way is all helping the community. Hi, uh, I see a lot of good uh, essential and uh, tools and API today. Um, has um, my society considered to build a survey kind of a tool or API to conduct a survey uh, on the web for general public? Um. Almost all the components expose their data through an API that will be published, but that's not enough. Wherever possible, we use an open standard as well. So, for example, the politician's database is using the Popolo um, format. Is that the kind of thing you I think, I think the question was actually making a component that's for doing surveys. Is that correct? Yeah, maybe conduct or, or, yeah. So it's not something that we have built yet, or none of the partners has built yet, but I think it's certainly something that would be very interesting to have as a component. Um, it actually would potentially solve a challenge that we have as an organization, which is that we want to learn more about our users themselves. And at the moment, we have been, just last week, I was looking at on, you know, existing online survey tools, and there's some really good ones, but there are also some quite expensive ones. And if there was a free open source survey tool that exposed the data by an API and was just really good, then that would be fantastic. And it might already exist, that's the other thing. There's no big issue about membership of, the, of it becoming a populist component if it satisfies those seven criteria, um, which basically means it's useful and there are people actively sharing it, then we'd love um, to include it simply because it's a place where people looking for this kind of stuff can start to find it. Uh, I'm Linda from Gov Zero, and I participated in the project of uh, Open Political Campaign, uh, Open Political Campaign uh, contribution, which uh, intended to enter the uh, this uh, campaign contribution to politician, and we want to reveal the connection between politician and uh, a capitalist. So uh, I'm a user of Say It. And, uh, and pop it. And I think it is a very good tool uh, offering people to uh, crowdsourcing the uh, crowdsourcing the database of politicians. And you mentioned that the storytelling is very crucial for the open, uh, open source community or project like Oculus. So would you share uh, how you uh, how you encourage your people or user to uh, participate more in your populist project? So that's actually one of the big challenges, is getting people to talk more. We, we started off by, we, we held a conference back in April, which kind of started the movement, got a lot of people together, and we had the website. Uh, we've tried running regular Google Hangouts to get people together to try and talk, but we're realizing that that's actually, that's not, 
a way that that many people are engaging with. So what we're looking at now is seeing if we can do uh, more formalized newsletters, whether we can get people to record little videos just talking about their experiences, because I don't know if you're like me, but the idea of like writing a long blog post about something when you've got so much work to do can be a, you know, it can be using, uh, I'd rather not do that, but um, yeah, getting people to short, shoot little videos talking about their stories, about how they've used it, and not just using components, but generally in, in this space. Do you consider it uh, de uh, developing some less like that that system to encourage people to devote more in maybe say it yeah, maybe input in your project? Yeah, it's something that we had thought about having like you know tiers of if people start contributing code to it, then they can get um, like different badges and they can they can move up the scale. The truth is, at the moment, we're just so happy when anyone contributes code to it. But, you know, we just we just think it's fantastic, and we don't have that many people that to have created that kind of system yet. But I think in time, one thing we talked about across all of the populist movement is you know awarding people badges for their contributions and and recognising them more formally. Thank you. 因為我們一直到兩點,所以他點時間。所以我不想講英文。誒,你要翻譯嗎?你要翻譯嗎?沒有人嗎?Do <笑> you speak French? <笑><笑><笑> I know you travel a lot. Uh, in UK? Okay. <笑> Uh, I know you travel a lot. In UK, my society is, uh, uh, let's say, quite, uh, quite uh, successful. And in other countries, like, uh, I will follow uh, the question, in, in other countries, what do you learn from other countries when you, when you try to uh, propose your vision of my society in this country? Because in Taiwan, I think we are quite different in our culture and our, our way to talk about politics and maybe the difference you you learn from other countries if you can share with us. I, I think that's a really excellent point. One, one thing when we, we meet with new partners um, and we, we talk to them, what we try and do is not make no assumptions about how poli our experience of politics works in the UK might affect how things work in their country. So we work a lot in Sub-Saharan Africa, in Ghana, in uh, Kenya, in Nigeria and South Africa. And there, for instance, some people find it very hard to challenge authority. There's culturally, the, the politicians are kind of big, powerful people, and they, as a citizen, you shouldn't be questioning them. So what we aim to do there is to find easy ways that people can access their politicians. They can have the confidence to start talking to them. But we're very much guided by um, the partners that we work with. I, I think one thing, so, so the kind of the, the short answer is that in every case we try and meet with real users and we try and understand exactly the, the problems and challenges they're facing and the solutions that they want to get. We've, we've recently dedicated a lot more time before we write a line of code to spending time meeting users and potential users. But I think actually one thing that we are always astonished and pleased by is that in, in every country in the world, there are passionate people like you who care and want to make a difference and want to make change. Um, and that is just so inspiring and so exciting. One of the things uh, which is important to realize is my society has been very successful in the UK because it's been running a long time. And so that means if you, if you start a new project, that is already a very different landscape from the one we are operating in. And as some of you know, uh, my society's success has slowly changed the landscape of the political web in the UK, so government has responded to it. And of course, that very much changes the environment we're working in. So uh, whenever we're meeting uh, people outside, who by definition won't have had that uh, change already happening, it's already a different landscape that they're operating in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I have a small question is that uh, as you have worked with many countries, what are your adaptations or changes to countries with restricted networks 
or like um, some kinds of governments? The most extreme case um, for our consideration um, is internet penetration. Um, often the technological solution which we propose as a website just isn't the most obvious, it isn't the best solution for the majority of the population. That's certainly the case where we've been looking in Liberia recently. And uh, Myanmar is another country that's changing very quickly um, because the internet penetration at the start of the year was at about 8%. And by the end of next year, they think it's going to be 85%. And that is um, uh, because this is because the telecoms bill has allowed two phone companies to roll coverage out. No country has had the internet switched on that fast ever. So it's very hard to predict what the right kind of solution would be. So, so but I think also the, the question relating to government intervention. We work, for instance, with a group in Zimbabwe, and they are very. They, they are actually the people who, who largely operate the site are based in the US because they are concerned about the, the government attitude. Though what they've done uh, is start very, very small. They just started with a list of politicians to demonstrate that actually there's, there's no danger to having a list of politicians online. And they started to build the relationship with some members of parliament and the site's now starting to expand and get more information on there. So I think the answer to the question is um, where there is a regime that is potentially repressive, sometimes you just have to run it from a different country, you have to run the site from a different country, and you have to rely on people to get your information and pass it over to you. But in other circumstances, if you can demonstrate that actually there isn't anything to fear from a little bit of openness, and if you can get just one or two members of parliament to engage with you, getting someone inside parliament who can be a champion for you, that can help um, move the, the, the movement along. I should also say that um, the first event I in Kenya did have a phone bug by the security services, so <laughs> we have some mixed periods of the government intervening in other ways too. How? Say all depends on. I'm very really curious about your book about Turba. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> it's not me. I, I like to have lots of favourites, and because if you put the full titles in, it gets you can't have very many on there. So I, I have my own little system of coding my favourites, so I know so I can have a lot on there that are easy to get to. That's his entire personality profile. If you can work that out, I think you know everything about him. Thank you.